Welcome everyone. Today we have with us a guest on our show. We have Kyle Travel, who is a friend of mine and is also a Wi-Fi entrepreneur. That is, he makes all of his money online. He runs a blog that gets over 10 million viewers every year. He also runs an olive oil company and a recruiting agency. And today Kyle is going to tell us about his business journey and how you can also start making money on the internet. So Kyle, how are you? I'm good, Harsh. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm excited to talk to you and your audience about different online business I've done over the last 10 years. How did you get started in online business and what did you used to do before this? Yeah, in a past life, it seems like a very long time ago now, I was a data systems engineer. So I worked for a very large Japanese company and was basically a high level support analyst. Um, basically, you know, when big companies would call in, they'd say our data center's down, our systems are down. Um, and I would basically fix their problems. And, you know, we're talking very big companies, you know, huge banks, Fortune 500. Um, it was a very intense job and I really enjoyed it. And then I kind of moved on from that because it was Japanese. I was the youngest they'd ever hired and they were not ready to promote me until I was almost 30 years old. And I said, screw this. I'm not going to sit around Which and wait for it? it. That was 2012. I first started there. How old were you? 21. Oh, damn. So they didn't want to promote you for nine years? Yeah, they were like, I, I was already ready to move on to level two. And all the level twos wanted me to be there. And they said, uh, we can't promote you because it's a Japanese company and you need to be like 30 before they give you that responsibility. So I left and I moved to a customer then. So then I was just an admin and I hated that job because it was just sitting around doing nothing all day, waiting for something to break. It was very boring. So basically at that second job, I started building my initial blog and I would literally just write articles in a Gmail tab, which I would keep in the corner of my screen. And then if my boss came by, I would just change that tab and I would just mail the drafts myself to myself every night and then go home and actually, you know, format them and post them on the blog. So that was how I originally started, um, was basically building that out. I had no intention of monetizing at the time. I just wanted to write about what I was kind of going through in life, whether it be dating, whether it be my career. And then I was able to get kind of a weekly gig at Roosh's big kind of site that he was running with a lot of contributors. So that was Return of Kings. And that was kind of how I initially built then my actual blog. I started ranking in the search engines and I built an email list. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how I at least got going with that first initial business. Uh, for those wondering, by the way, Roosh is a Manosphere blogger or used to be a Manosphere blogger who was really big back in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was what? really big. He was the only was, one, really. Yeah, with he his was space really out there. big. Yeah. He, he isn't that big nowadays. I think he I did some pivot to Christianity and is talking about completely different topics now. Yeah, correct. I think he's actually probably quite big in that sphere now. His re overall readership it could be just as high, if not higher. I have no idea, honestly. But yeah, he basically shut down everything else that he'd ever posted about game and women and dating, um, you know, just cleansed his whole site, sites of all those articles, the books, everything. So yeah, he's totally pivoted. What do you think of the blogging business currently? Because back in the day, I say back in 2013, you could start a blog and you could get a million readers really fast if you were good. Yeah. But nowadays it's really hard and people are more on social media than reading blog articles. Yeah, I think it's very unfortunate because when you have the blog, you know, you have to pay for web hosting, but you weren't really at the mercy of any companies besides Google. You could still keep your subscribers, you could get people onto your email list, and it was very easy to rank and build like a good viewership. Back in those days, and I sound very old when I say this, obviously, because it was, you know, 2013, 2014, people actually read articles now, though, which I don't think people have the attention spans to sit down in most cases and read 2,000, 3,000 word articles. They just don't. So yeah, now we're on this system where everyone's on the social media platforms um, and, you know, the good entrepreneurs, the, the smart people are obviously getting people to sign up to their own email list, selling directly and making sure that they are retaining their customers on some level. But yeah, there's so many people with huge Twitter accounts or huge YouTube followings that, you know, they're totally at those companies mercy, which is kind of unfortunate. But yeah, the blogging is a lot different these days. I don't you know, I, I don't really even blog that much anymore. I just do my emails and I post the newsletters to my website, but th it's definitely changed over time. 2013 is a lot like, you know, two or three generations ago in internet years, like Facebook was relevant and 
people used to read articles and it was just like <laughs> a completely different world you know we didn't have yeah. tiktok yeah it was a totally different atmosphere than man and it was in that time like the manosphere really was a sense of community like not many people at that point had their faces out there it was very much still underground um you know and i think at that point you know you hadn't you talk about this a lot right the the dating pool and how things have shifted over time and at that time it really hadn't gotten so bad in the western world as far as just our cultural fall so people it was not as extreme as it is now it wasn't as polarizing but at the same time people were still figuring out what was starting to happen and we're starting to put information out there about how to beat it but it hadn't really tipped over yet where now everybody's saying oh screw this like i need to get out of the western world so yeah it was a very different time then obviously and it's really shifted a lot in the last decade how about today let's say today if someone starts a blog what should they do and how should they monetize it like how do you actually start a blog and start making real cash from it how do you actually generate income from these assets i would say honestly the best way is pretty much how you teach in the art of twitter your book is just build a social media presence and then be sending people to your blog so use the social media as a way to get them in and then send them to your longer form stuff because at that point they're at least a little more likely to read the longer form stuff that oh, said see, go ahead why do you even if you go with that strategy you don't really need the longer form stuff right you can send them directly to your products from social media yes you can that that said though if you are able to rank for the right keywords for the longer form stuff then you have an opportunity to over time maybe be getting a couple thousand passive visitors every day who you then can sell on your email list and then you can sell directly to them um it all depends really you know for example if you're writing really long twitter threads with solving a specific problem it's certainly worthwhile to try to find a relevant keyword add a few hundred words to it and make it an seo friendly article over time so it's that said it is not a direct quick way to be making money by trying to rank in search engines right and i think that's the big appeal with social media is that if you're good you can get that first thousand subscribers or followers relatively quickly and then be able to start monetizing that immediately whereas you know a thousand visitors a day in the search engines is probably going to take you at least 4 to 6 months in a lot of cases agreed i would say blog income like i have a friend who makes like $20,000 every single month from just a blog and he doesn't use social media at all like he does use them but it's very minimal you could say yeah um, it used to be the case where you could do that you know and you still can it's just a lot more competitive he still does than it, it used to be yeah um i used to also build a lot of little small niche sites so i had my main blog which was this is trouble.com but then i built out a site about living in ukraine and at one point um yeah that one i was doing almost no work and it made like 20 grand a month and i was i maybe worked like 3 or 4 hours a week on it if that i hired one content writer i basically started with 50 articles i paid her to write 10 articles a month she would post them i'd do a quick review and it i almost did nothing i i almost had to do nothing i should say to actually make that money but if you don't keep up with all the seo changes and you don't you know competition too people start just blatantly copying everything um word for word even they change a few things around so everything just gets a little bit tougher over time and it's kind of gotten more saturated but yeah wait so your website on living in ukraine how did it actually make money and can you tell us a bit more about the process so tell us how you started the site yeah what you thought about it what keywords you targeted well, and so how you actually turned it to cash back then it was very simple just to you could rank for a lot of keywords about like dating for example so you would just go into SEM rush which is just an SEO keyword tool and you would look at the competition levels and i would say like hey i think i can be at the top or within the top 3 to 5 for this keyword and i basically just had hundreds of different keywords all about mostly dating so in that industry man it's very profitable if you are able to get someone to sign up to the really expensive like there's no other way to put it like simp websites where people pay like per email or per im I mean they pay you like 300 to 500 for a sign up because then yeah. they're in that they basically then they can send roses they can you know get on translate they can get translations it's just this reoccurring like ponzi scheme and it's it's honestly was not the most ethical thing i've ever done in my life but i realized <laughs> that people were willing to do it so it's like well all right um and then even there were some at the time that were decent dating sites where you actually could just build you know a, a decent relationship with someone um you could get their number it was just a like tinder but 
more old school, you could say. So I, I would say like start with this site, but if you really want, you can go to this other site and people would often do both. So that was pretty much how I monetized it. Um, and then I would also just throw in some other articles about living in Ukraine, you know, city guides, that kind of thing. And once that one was having success, um, I started just building it out for other countries. I built one for Russia. I built one for other, you know, general Eastern Europe. I built one for Colombia, Brazil. I basically just had dozens of these little niche dating sites that would just bring in tons of money off of those dating site referrals, plus some occasional like travel referrals, language courses. And yeah, that was, that was, oh, that, when was that? That was like really 2016, 17, that was doing the best. And it's gotten a little difficult since, but yeah, they were very profitable. How about today, if someone had to start a new website, what would be a good niche? Now, and I don't mean like something very specific. I mean, like, see, generally you could say that health, money, and relationships are like the three evergreen things everyone wants to learn about. Mm -hmm. Well, what I would say is that there is a very key differentiator between a blog and a focused website. So if you are going to start a blog that has an inherently personal nature to it, right? It's almost like being attached to a personal brand. And if you just write for the sake of writing, then that's not going to rank. You're not going to get any organic traffic. You're going to have to send the traffic to your site via your social channels. Whereas if you are setting up a specific site, solving a specific problem around specific keywords, that doesn't necessarily have to have like a brand attached to it. So I like to look at it like a blog is really kind of uh, an add on to your personal brand. Uh, but you can, of course, find keywords that are relevant and, and post them. But I would say, you know, obviously health, wealth, relationships, those are the big ones. Um, but you've really got to get your SEO right. You really have to play the long game in that regard. So how does someone actually improve their SEO? Like, what does that even mean? Because most people have heard of the term, but they don't really know what to do. What are your uh... tips? I, I don't really do it that much anymore. So I'm really not fully up to date in 22 about what to do. I would say the big thing is that it has to start with a, a relative foundation, right? The content has to be good and it has to load fast. And then from there, you can start getting into, you know, Google optimizing their mobile pages, um, you know, basically getting time on page, all these different factors are going to get you to rank, but really, you know, good content, good design and fast and mobile friendly are the big ones these days, I'd say. That's at least how you start. Have you noticed that a lot of articles that were written for SEO are actually really annoying to read because they do yeah. things like in this article, when we're going to discuss about topic and I'll show you how to do the best in topic, topic, topic. And the same and, yeah. topic keeps popping up like third times an article. I think and it's really annoying. That was the thing back in the day. You could just write for those. And the algorithms in the AI were not smart enough to detect that. That was how you won the SEO game was really just hitting those keywords and making sure everything was optimized. These days, those AI machines, I think have gotten a lot smarter. And so you have to actually do quite a bit more. Like I said, it used to be very, very easy. It's gotten a lot more difficult. And I think a lot of that is because the SEO engines have gotten a lot smarter. I see. So your recommendation for someone who wants to build a content or what do you call it? info product type business on the internet would be a personal oh, sorry um a focused website along with social media yeah i really can't say i would recommend you just build a website because you're just always at the mercy i mean it's the same thing with a personal brand really but you're always at the mercy of the algorithm changes with google and then constantly you know affiliate programs they only get worse over time like no affiliate ever says we're gonna give them more money right they always are cutting down your commissions. Amazon goes from 12 to 8 to 4%. So I can't really recommend you just build a website these days. I would say you should build a social media presence, use that to get traffic, write some good SEO or articles, and kind of do both of them. Try to repurpose everything that you can, use it in multiple places, and, and to go that as a route instead of just doing a website. I see. You also had a business where you were selling a physical product. Correct. Like oil. Yep. How yeah. does that work? What are the logistics of that? And how do people actually start something like this? Oh, that's, you know, so there's a couple ways you can do that. So I started an olive oil company, um, celloolive.com, based off of a reader and friend who I met in Prague. His name is Martin. And he was looking to bring up a marketer on. And he had a basically family orchard in Croatia. 
with olive trees and they had the oil and we wanted to basically bring it to the Western world. So um, he partnered with me and we kind of have built that out over the, the last few years. And like the first thousand liters, we literally bottled in his garage in Canada. So we had it shipped over and then I went to Canada and we bottled it there, labeled it there and shipped it straight out to customers from the post office. So with that, it, I mean, these days it's logistically, it's very difficult. I'll put it that way. Um, the better way obviously is to do more of a, a drop shipping or not necessarily drop shipping, but uh, someone else doing the fulfillment, right? Where you're just in charge of the marketing. So if you have a physical product like that, you have to really be putting up a lot of time and effort and capital to secure the inventory, house it, you know, get it all set up and then get it shipped out. Whereas if you can just pay someone to do that when you make the sales, that's a much better option. I mean, I look at it this way, right? If we we had a thousand liters of olive oil sitting in the garage, like what if we hadn't sold any of it? You know, it would have just been sitting there. So that is the real differentiator. If you can get your, your feet in the water and at least start selling and make sure that your offer is good, that's a much better way than actually doing the product yourself. I see. But for example, when you're doing the product yourself, how do you deal with the customers? For example, someone says the bottle was broken or I, ne I never got it, you know, like even though they did receive it, they're trying to scam you. So we what is your advice on that? We, it was a very expensive product or is a very expensive product, right? You know, $70 for 750 milliliters when we started. So generally speaking, we had a higher level of customer. So we didn't have too many issues like that. Obviously we had the shipping information and could say, Hey, it was delivered any breakage or spoilage. We would just replace instantly and eat the cost. So you have to factor all of that into, you know, your margins and what the business is actually going to make. So it is a constant battle. I'll put it that way. Um, like I said, though, I have done drop shipping too. And when you're selling little 20 or $30 products from China, the quality of customer is a lot lower. And in that case, you are, you know, you fight chargebacks is what most people will do when they're doing drop shipping, you know, Oh, it didn't get delivered. You say, yeah, it was, you know, the tracking number clearly states it was delivered. So you just fight it. Um, and then obviously as you grow and get bigger, if you're actually building a brand around that, store then you obviously want to have good customer service and you might have to eat the cost but that's generally what you have to do man is make the customer happy interesting so you were doing drop shipping how does that work like what does the model look like and how does someone get into it oh that model i really never got too into it and i can't really say i'd recommend that one either to be honest um basically then you would just find a supplier most people start with aliexpress and they set up a shopify store with aliexpress and then they run typically Facebook ads to their Shopify store and get people to make orders. And there's enough software out there now with uh, Shopify and AliExpress integration that if they order on Shopify, then it automatically you know, sends it over to AliExpress. It places the order from your account with the customer's information in it, and then it ships out to them. Um, you obviously don't get your actual name on it. You pretty much you know, you can put like a little label on it, like from XYZ company sometimes, but it's going to come from China or, you know, some of the AliExpress vendors actually have vendors in different countries. So they're able to ship it directly from within that country, but it all just depends on the product and, you know, what you're selling, obviously, but that's kind of how the model works in a nutshell. I see. So essentially it's like cheap Chinese stuff being sold by different brands, but it's the same actual manufacturer. Oh, correct. It's uh, all the same. Yeah. It's the same product. So when you see like, you know, on Amazon, you search for things like a kitchen scale and you find like the same looking scale being sold by a hundred different companies, it's being drop shipped essentially. Pretty much. Yeah. And I mean, that's what the goal, right? Is that if it's going well enough, then you reach out to the supplier and say, Hey, I'd like you to actually white label my business on it. I'd like you to add this customer card and you try to make the experience a little bit better. Or maybe if it's going really well, you're even able to, you know, have some inventory where you are and, you know, have your own shipper. So that's like what we did with the olive oil company was once it started doing good, we just sent a thousand bottles to our location that just did all the shipping then. So then it got a little bit easier. So, you know, the fulfillment was taken care of, but that's usually the goal with something like an e-commerce store is that you test it by doing the, the cheap Chinese knockoff stuff. And then if it's going well, then you try to actually find a legitimate supplier and do and, you know, take a little more steps to make sure that your customer's happy. I see China really changed the game, you know, for 
selling yes. and distributing things. Like it's cheaper to import something from China and then like have it sent to the customer directly than to actually sometimes ship it using the post system. Yeah, correct. And I mean, the manufacturing, I don't know what it's like in India, but manufacturing in the United States is just, it's so expensive. It's, I don't think it's feasible for most businesses. So they've had to look at China. Um, and it's like the same thing too. If you're just trying to make some Wi-Fi money and get your foot in the water with online business, are you going to spend, you know, $10,000, $20,000 to get something going in the US? Or are you just going to spend $1,000 on Facebook ads? And if it goes well, you just order it from China. Like one of them has absolutely no risk besides the money you put into the ads in the Shopify store. The other one, you've got to put your balls on the line um, and have inventory and do all sorts of stuff. And it may not even work out. Lately, I've heard Facebook ads have taken a hit because of Apple. Yeah, I mean, it's been progressively getting worse over the last few years, man. I mean, even just in 2019, 2020, it was this constant battle. I lost like probably 10 or 20 Facebook ad accounts, just, you know, banned. No reason why. It's not like you can actually talk to a human and get them back. Same thing with the olive oil company. Um, when we first launched, it was called Cello Oils, which means like village oils because it's from a small town. Um, but Oil is like a, a key word that Facebook was banning everybody because it was connected to CBD, cannabis oil. So wow. we had to change the name to Cello Olive. So yeah, that Facebook is, and it's, it's so much more expensive now just for the traffic. So it's really gotten progressively worse over the years and they've cracked down, Apple's cracked down, you know, they're trying to make it a better experience and not have people buy junk. So it's the barrier to entry certainly gotten higher. I see, man, that's crazy. I mean, it's like your entire business is based on advertising on this company and getting the stuff from China. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's like nothing is working, right? Getting stuff from China is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And advertising has gotten way more expensive. So a lot of these stores have just closed down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, dude, there's probably billions of Shopify stores that have died a death of just going out of business for no reason whatsoever. You know, it's... It's not a sustainable business. You have to, once you validate the idea, start doing something more legitimate with it. You just have to. I'm telling you, unless you know what you're doing, the entire inventory and physical product business is not worth the effort. It's you really can make not. So much more money, either like a content based business on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Inst not Facebook, maybe say Instagram, whatever, um, write articles. Or start a SaaS company if you learn how to code. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think, Harsh? I'll tell you. We started selling those bottles, 750 milliliters for about 70 to 75 US. What do you think? How much profit do you think we made after everything was said and done? Because people are like, that's so expensive. And it is. But what do you think we made on that? Take a guess. $20. A little bit more. Maybe 25 25 okay yeah so yeah 75 dollar product we made maybe 20 25 bucks basically off that with shipping importing bottling all of that just added up so you're totally right it is it's barely worth the headaches yeah it's like it just isn't worth the effort unless you have like some big brand like for example if i start selling coffee it'll probably be worth it because i have mm -hmm. my own audience so i don't need to pay for advertisement Mm -hmm. but someone who's like paying for ads they it's not worth it you know yeah and that's why the whole drop shipping thing got so much traction because it took a lot of the headache and risk away that was why it, it did so well but of course the price then is that the customers have suffered with junk products and now facebook and has cracked down on that so it's all just this vicious little cycle it's interesting that Facebook is cracking down on junk products, given that oh, Facebook right. itself is a junk product. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you remember the original, but Facebook used to actually be useful and it worked and it's so bad now. Like all their UI updates and everything have made it so progressively bad over the last few years. I mean, it's barely usable now. I don't know. The last time I used Facebook was maybe 2013 and I deleted my account in 2015. Mm -hmm. And the only person in my house who uses Facebook is my mother. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like it's just all used by older people now. Yeah, it's, in other words, it's boomer that, software is what we say. Like in say, in other words, it's going to like not survive, you know, in like say 30 years. 
it won't be around anymore. Uh, I think that's why they've maybe gone with the whole rebranding thing with Meta and everything, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I think they're still a very profitable company. So we will, I guess, see if they're still around. But yeah, I think that was probably what they're trying to do is make sure they're ahead of the game with the whole rebrand and the metaverse and all the other stuff they're doing. What do you think of that, though? I think that it's like, I don't, I don't see the point of, you know, the metaverse thing seems like way too far away. I don't know. I have a lot of conviction in crypto. It's just that the metaverse thing just doesn't feel like it's happening in any time in the next 40 years. I think they're really pushing it and they're hoping people are going to jump on board. And I think maybe the whole COVID thing was trying to accelerate that to a certain extent. Like, oh, you know, we're going to stay inside and you can just live in the metaverse or whatever it might be. But I don't think people are really buying it. That's It's still... Nothing transcends the physical world, right? Where we actually live and where we are as much as they want it to. It's just not going to get there. Um, I agree with you. I have a hard time imagining it taking off in the next couple decades. But at the same time, it'll be really interesting because the generations that are coming up now are the ones that, you know, they have a little smartphone in front of them when they're like three years old. So it's possible that the generation that's being born, you know, in the last few years, maybe they're open minded to it. I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Like I, th- I'm not. I don't. I don't think it's a technical problem. Like I, I bet they could technically come up with a solution and actually mm-hmm. make the metaverse. I'm just unconvinced that. See, it's like the VR headset thing. Okay, like it's a revolutionary technology. But how many people do you know actually use it? I only know one person who has exactly one, so. no one uses it. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Like it's like, yeah, okay, it's cool to see. But no one actually wants to use it. You know what, though? I mean, I think you're in your mid-20s. I mean, I'm 30, just turned 30. So, like, our generation, we still like to actually go outside and do stuff, right? But maybe future generations won't. I mean, and think about how much the world has shifted just in the last 10 or so years, right? They've convinced all sorts of people of all sorts of things. So, you know, it might take a generation or two. It seems like a long time for us. But in the scheme of things, you know, changing a core belief of a new generation is certainly possible. I think they, you know, governments and whoever's pulling all the strings has shown that. So it's possible the next ones might be all on board with it. It is possible. In fact, I would say now that you mentioned this, the probability is in the double digits, like the low double digits. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think it, it won't be with like guys like you and me though, right? It won't be it's our be, yeah, for the kids. Yeah, it'd be the next one. So it'd be looking at like our kids potentially. So we're looking like 50 or so years before they're, you know, adults and that kind of thing. Man, that is insane. Yeah, we'll see. You you also run a a recruiting company, correct? How is that going and how does that work? Tell us more. Yeah, so I started that um, at the end of 2020. Um, after, actually, it was pretty much after some of my dropshipping stores were pretty much just put out of business by COVID, and I was kind of trying to figure out something else to do. So basically, we place uh, uh, Ukrainian VAs or developers or really any position with Western companies. So basically, you know, the Western companies say, come to us, they say, we'd like to fill this position. And then we go and try to find Ukrainians because that's where I was living before. I have a lot of connections to that area and try to get them all set up. So it's basically what I like to call a a basic service-based business or a recruiting agency, which I definitely think is a really good option for people to make Wi-Fi money in 2022. I think it's probably the the most recession-proof. I think it's probably the most like social media proof. So you don't have to worry about big companies kind of up in your business. I think it's a really good route for people. And it's really as simple as find a problem and solve the problem for people. Um, So yeah, that's what I've been doing. Obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's been a common thing with Filipino um, in the India market for the last decade or so, you know, a lot of people have outsourced to those regions. So it's very similar to that. Interesting. So how does actually someone start this business in the sense someone was to, how do you find a good VA? What do you look for? Well, how would you start this business? Probably the, the better way is to look at the macro model of it, right? So I basically I'm solving the problem that companies can't hire good people or potentially they're too expensive in the Western world. So I'm solving their problem that they can't get the help they need. So that's if you're looking to start something, 
think about what skills you have and what problems you can solve. Like, for example, let's say you're a talented designer. A lot of companies still don't have good websites or they're not mobile friendly or they're not able to rank, whatever it might be. So how do you solve that problem for them? And you have to present the solution. So in my case, you know, it's very easy. We handle all the recruiting process. A lot of companies, they don't want to go find candidates. They don't know where to find them. So we source them. So that saves their time. We only give them three candidates. We schedule the interviews. Again, it saves them time. We make sure that they speak English. Again, you know, that's a big concern for people when it comes to hiring overseas talent. So we just try to take all the problems of finding people and especially finding overseas these people and just eliminate the problems for those businesses. I see. So you smooth the process out in the sense you're more like a broker. You could say like you handle the entire, what do you call it? Paperwork. Correct. Yeah. We try to take everything hands off. You hire us and then we place someone. So you don't have to search for the CVs. You don't have to pre-screen them for their English. Um, you know, we make sure that everyone going for an interview is really prepared and, you know, makes a good impression. So it's, yeah, we solve that problem. And yeah, a middleman in many ways, you could definitely say that for sure. Makes sense, man. I have to ask you something. Now that you moved yeah. back from Ukraine to the US, how is the tax situation? Would you still say consider moving somewhere to the East again? Well, so as a US citizen, um, you are taxed by your citizenship, not your location. So no matter where I am in the world, I am obligated to file and pay U.S. taxes, no matter what, until I renounce my citizenship. There's only three countries in the world that do this. That's the United States, uh, Eritrea, and North Korea. So great company <laughs> that the United States is in. <sighs> Land of the free, right? Um, so, but you just have to, you know, be smart about it to a certain extent. So basically, as a U.S. citizen, if you're out of the country 330 days of the year, you are off the hook for some things, you know, you're able to reduce your bill significantly. Obviously I'm not going to have that this year. Um, overall though, you know, I try to keep the majority of my money in my companies and you, you know, use them for living expense, you know, for a lot of things can be written off and people don't realize that. So you just have to kind of be clever, get a good account and then just go from there. Yeah, of course. Like that makes complete sense. However, how is how are things in the US right now? I heard that the inflation rate there is insane and yeah. people are not doing well. I would say that is very, very accurate. Basically, you know, the dollar has been the reserve currency of the world for quite a few decades now. But if you look at if you just Google something like purchasing power of the dollar over time, you can see that it's really been reduced since like 1972 or whenever we went off the gold standard. So it's already been bad. Um, you know, for example, just being able to buy a home these days is certainly much tougher than it was for the previous generation. That said, you know, everything on the news is certainly not to be believed. I know you know this. I know your audience knows that. So it's not as bad as it looks. Um, you know, it's not like people are just killing each other in the streets all the time and that everyone's in danger all the time. You know, maybe in the big cities, that is the case, but not in the smaller towns. But yeah, things are extremely expensive for sure. I mean, the gas, it's never, I've never seen it higher than $4 per gallon in my life. And it's now, you know, when I was just driving down in Southern California, I saw it at $8. So it's almost doubled from, you know, a it's year at ago. $8 a gallon. That's and, crazy. Yeah. Parts of Los Angeles, it was like eight twenty a gallon. So yeah, um, obviously everything's gotten more expensive for sure. I mean, you can't go out to dinner for two people without spending less than $75, I'd say. And, you know, meat is extremely expensive in the market. It's probably double or triple what it used to be. Yeah. So they want everybody just eating soy and eating bugs and living in the metaverse. Hey man, don't talk about food like that. <laughs> okay. I think I might have to censor this thing. <laughs> to not get banned from YouTube. Oh no. <laughs> man but this is insane like what's happening is crazy yeah i don't really know how people are doing it i think the best way to describe it and i'm not sure how familiar you and your readers are with this but basically america most people live off of credit and paycheck to paycheck i mean i know people that are making like you know 300 grand a year and they spend all of it it is paycheck to paycheck by the time the taxes come out and by the time you pay your property tax 
you pay all these other things, your vehicle registration, your vehicle insurance, your medical insurance, you know, all of that, it just adds up. It's like death by a thousand cuts. And it's very common for people to take out a credit card to pay for something new, like a washer or dryer or a new iPhone, or, you know, everything's just on a monthly plan on a monthly credit. And it's very difficult for average people to get ahead. I would say that this this type of stuff has happened a lot of times in the past. And yeah, average people do get screwed. But mm-hmm. nowadays, I think that the average person who is intelligent can escape all this bullshit by starting a Wi-Fi business, you know, an online I, business yeah. in stream, and your problem is solved. I fully agree with that. But that requires a certain entrepreneurial spirit and desire to go get it done whereas most people just simply don't have that and i think at least in the united states it used to be that most men for example could just go get a basic job you know and that was enough to in many cases buy a first house buy a couple cars take a couple vacations a year and maybe even you know buy a second house or a vacation home and retire at a decent age with a decent amount of money in the bank and able to you know, live the rest of your life, you know, spend good time with your family. And most people are pretty happy just to have that. And I think that's where at least my country and my culture has gotten way, way, way too complacent and just fell asleep at the wheel as it's all kind of really unraveled over the last decade. I will say it's not a culture per se. I think this is happening across the world, you know? Yeah. Like earlier in India, like if you were a guy and you had like a decent job, you could feed like your wife and your children. Nowadays, your wife probably has to work. Mm-hmm. So things have changed. Things have changed. And some changes happen for the better and some for the worse, of course. Yeah, I think it's made it so if you're cream of the crop, it's never been easier to be at the top, right? You know, it used to be if you were exceptional, you were just still stuck at companies trying to jump around and people didn't used to also change jobs as much either. Right. So you, that was seen as bad or disloyal. So you were just stuck at the companies you were at, hoping you got promoted and kind of just grinding it out. Um, but yeah, with Wi-Fi money and that ability for anyone to really just make an internet income, you know, you don't really have an excuse, right? You can have a normal job and then just build something on the side and eventually go full time on that. And people just aren't, you know, they don't want to do that. It's a lot of work. Have you noticed that this situation that you mentioned, you know, where some people are doing ex- absurdly well, some people are doing really, really, really well, and others just lack spirit and they're like barely getting by or like getting screwed left and right, applies to everything. Like yesterday, I was speaking to someone and he was telling me that one of his friends paid a girl $200 to ha- get a hug. And the girl took his money and didn't oh. give him a hug. <laughs> a hug? A hug. So this is in a the US. Hug. A Holy hug. A hug, yeah. Crap. Some only fans girl. And this guy pays him to pays her two hundred dollars to get a hug. And she doesn't give him a hug. So he files a charge back. <laughs> and the girl is like, okay, I will give you a hug if you reverse your charge back and give me fifty more bucks or something like that. <laughs> And this guy does that. He gives her like, you know, like 50 bucks and reverses the charge back, goes to her building. She comes down, gives him like a one second hug. And then she goes back up. And my friend who's telling me about this guy is asking him like, is it worth it? And one thing that really stuck out to me was that he said like, this is like the some kind of like, you know, two different worlds, you know, because my friend is like, he's ripped, he's, he's fit. And he sleeps with like a lot of women very easily because he looks, you know, he looks good, has a good personality, etc. He's like, brother, we we don't live in the same world. Like this guy, like he, there's like some kind of like wage gap or something here, you know. It's like <laughs> this guy has to pay to get a hug, and <laughs> like if you're like a good or like a or a fit guy, you can like sleep in the US with as many women as you want without even buying them anything. You can just message them, come to my house, or you know, yep. why don't you just come over and they'll come over? That's totally true, man. I mean, I used to, I'll tell a story here. So when I was living in Los Angeles, I had this one girl. She was from a very rich family. I think her dad owned like all the slot machines in most of the casinos in California. And her parents were constantly setting, trying to set her up with like other 
you know, guys that they knew through family, friends, like other wealthy guys. So she'd go out to dinner with them and she'd message me like, can I come over after? And I would write her back and say, what restaurant are you at? She'd tell me the restaurant and I say, you can come over, but you have to order this, this and this to go make him pay for it and bring it to me. And <laughs> it would work. I had a, quite a few free meals from that. So that <laughs> is just the case, man. If you really know what you're doing, at least here, I mean, it's very easy. The reason I bring it up is not to mock these poor guys, but the reason I bring it up is that a lot of what is going on in the world is out of your control. But of course, you can work to get yourself in the top positions, you know. Instead of being the guy paying 200 bucks to, you know, get a hug, you can you can be the guy who gets laid for free without, mm -hmm. you know, even buying the girl a drink. I think there's something in the States, too. It's taken off. It's like a, a cuddling service where guys will pay <laughs> like 500 bucks to go cuddle with someone for like an hour. Man, that is... It's the similar most... to the hug story. <laughs> it, it's, it's so silly. It's so silly that people pay for these things, but... The same thing applies to money, you know, like it's not fair that we have unlimited inflation and everything is getting expensive and, you know, this is not your fault. But what can you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. What yeah. can you do to actually live a great life? Well, start some kind of online income stream. And I think that's where people need to put their efforts in because otherwise they're like the guy who will eventually end up paying to get a hug. Like you're gonna eat grasshoppers or something like that, you know, because you wouldn't be able to afford good food because mm -hmm. you didn't start a business. Yeah, I mean, it is unfortunate. And you're right; it's not fair. But you know what? Life is just simply not fair. Um, and you, and that's the thing too. If all you're gonna do is say it's not fair, then you're gonna be reading the news. You're gonna be all worked up about it, and you're gonna be mad, sad, and angry. So funnel all of that instead of reading the news and feeling all those crappy emotions. Funnel it into something useful. Hmm. I I agree with the whole transmutation process, like the you know channeling your anger and energy into productive tasks. You have to now. I mean, there's just so much rage all the time, and especially just on the internet and with the news, right? It's designed to make you mad. So you might as well just turn it off and do something productive with your time, because, like you said, you're not going to change it. So you might as well do what you can. So, Carl, to summarize, if someone was dead broke, say 2022, they're 23 years old, they're dead broke, how, what should they do and how should they actually start making some money on the internet? What I would, is your recommendation? I would start looking to see what skills you have. Do you have a skill that you can perform that you can sell? Whatever it might be, you know, it could be audio engineering, could be video editing, could be copywriting, could be web design, and start with that. You know, and if you're really just going to do it all on the Internet, um, you know, start with building a, a Twitter profile, you know, actually tweet about what you want to sell and what you can do and then start reaching out to people. But I also think people get too wrapped up in the little world of, say, online business or Twitter. There's a lot of local businesses that could probably use a web design, right, or a, a, some sort of advertising or anything like that. Um, and I think it's better to sell business to business if you're selling a service than selling, say, you know, business to consumer. So that's where I would be looking is figuring out what skill you have and then how to sell it. I agree with you there. For people who are looking to start an online business on Twitter, they can check out the art of Twitter. That is my guide yep. on how to do it. The links will be in the description. Regarding selling to businesses, I agree. If you're in the West, if you're in the East, you know, Indian money is not really worth much. Mm -hmm. And you get paid by Indian standards if you are dealing in India. Very true. So I would not recommend spending too much time offline in India. Like, just focus on online money. Mm -hmm. Because Western currencies are really strong. Even though they're weakening, relative to Indian currencies, they're really, really good. Mm -hmm. yeah, so my recommendation enough. for the third worlders is to just focus on online business. And Twitter is a great way for that. And check out my guide. Yeah. No, it's a good guide. I've used it. It's definitely check it out for sure. Um, 
Yeah, that's what I would say though. Service business and just try to find something new you're good at and you can sell. That's probably the best way to start from zero. I also think in a lot of cases, you know, if you're young, be looking for remote jobs, right? You know, there's no reason in a lot of cases that your nine to five can't be done from like nine to 12. So if you're able to say, get a decent gig, especially with a Western company and you go in and you kick ass and you're able to get things done and not, you know, shorter than that eight hour block, then you have other time you can use. Just be smart about it. You know, if you have to be online from nine to five, get all your work done, check your messages from one to five, you know, occasionally respond and then work on your own projects on the side too. That's how you could really get ahead if you're starting from zero. Makes complete sense, brother. All right, Kyle, this was great talking to you. It's you been well. a while. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Where can people find you? You can find me at kyletrouble.com. I have an email I send out every day about online business and other topics like this. And then just on Twitter at Kyle Trouble. All right, Kyle. All the links will be in the description. And have a great day. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you for having me. Cheers. If you like this video, make sure that you click the like button, the subscribe button, and make sure that you leave a comment. And I, if I see your comment, I'll give you a response. Press the notification bell because that will notify you when a future video comes out. And I'll catch you in a couple of days with a new video. Have a great day and see you.